privilege um, to introduce two ladies to you. I'm going to start with um, the very first one that's going to bring some remarks. Um, it is someone that um, I've gotten to know a few years ago, and you know, sometimes you just meet somebody and immediately know that's a kindred spirit. And that's what I have found in, in Mayor Nelson. Um, Mayor Nelson is a graduate of South Carolina State University where she got her bachelor's in speech, speech pathology. She also went on to get her master's in public administration from Troy State. Um, she is a fabulous, dedicated woman of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, and in 2011, she was um, elected in a very historic special election um, and became uh, the first African-American female mayor of the city of Manning. Um, she was, yes. <laughs> she um, was elected in that special election to fill an unexpired term of the then mayor who went on to the House of Representatives. So a year later, she had um, her regular election and was unopposed in that election. And, and so she has continued to serve as mayor. Prior to being mayor, she was, um, a district a board member of Clarendon School District 2 and she has also served as a congressional um, district delegate to the National Democratic Convention for the 6th Congressional District. Um, she is a mother of a 13 year old son Nelson um, and as I say kindred spirit um, Julia is someone um, that uh, uh, Representative Cobb Hunter just said, which is really true. She is a she is a servant. Um, she serves her community. Um, she serves the Lord, and she um, is is such a wonderful spirit. Um, you know when elected officials are in something for the right reasons, and they will fight for what is right, even though it's not always popular. And we all know that in the fields that we work in, um, the fight in South Carolina continues. And um, we have to have people on all levels of government, all levels of community, all levels of education um, to recognize that we are all in this together and we've got to fight for um, what is right and fight that so that no woman is living in fear. And so um, it is my pleasure to introduce all of you to Mayor Julia Nelson. Good afternoon, everyone, Good afternoon. and thank you so much for that warm introduction and the warm greeting we received earlier. I'm humbled to be before you uh, to speak on such a matter that has great heartfelt meaning to me because I am a survivor of domestic violence. And as you look at me, you can't tell, there's not a certain face for people that can be victims of domestic violence. I'm just very thankful for how far God has brought me and to be able to stand here before you as a living person and a survival of domestic violence. I would also, before I go any further, like to tell you about a little bit about Council Member Isaac. Remember, what day is election? <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and truly, you know, this is a little sidebar, but we do need more women in leadership. And what I like to tell people, you have somebody in leadership that's doing a good job. Don't work against them. Work with them and for them. And one of you may need to rise up, whether you start with the school board in your local communities, and start working. Because females, we go to the heart of the matter. We look at the details. So we need more women out there advocating for everybody. So please let that simmer on your souls for a little while. <laughs> but for the matter at hand today, we all know the alarming fact that South Carolina is number one in domestic violence in the nation. And we've heard the horrifying statistics. In 2011, there was a total of 52 people murdered by a household member. Of those 52 people, 39 were women, constituting 75% of the total, and 13 were men, constituting 25% of the total. The demographics of the victims are as follows. 38% African American, 56% white, 4% Hispanic, 2% Asian. The average age was 39. 27 counties reported one or more domestic homicide in 2011. The weapons of choice, guns were the primary weapons. In 54% of the cases, 
a gunshot wound was listed as the primary cause of death. The next weapon of choice, knives. Knives were used 21% of the time. And the other percentages involved strangling and other matters. And some even drug, forced drug overdose. Now I want to commend everybody that's here today. I know we have survivors in the room. I know we have advocates in the room. And we need all of you. But today, I want to talk to you about our personal role. And it's good that we're advocates. It's good that we want to make people aware. But it's time that we start looking at our check registers of the organizations that we're involved in, even our personal bank accounts. Now, most of us, or most churches, can afford to have a domestic crisis center or shelter on their own. But what can we do together? Mostly in every community or a nearby county, there is a women's shelter. I would like to ask you to commit today to so organizations, your sororities, your fraternities, your Masonic, whatever organization you're a part of, and especially your churches, if you could just make a donation annually to them. I know in Manning we have a shelter where they struggle every month to make their payment. They shouldn't have to with the number of churches we have, the number of organizations we have. Find out how you can support your neighboring shelter. And you might be surprised at what you can do. Because when they get those calls 12 o'clock in the in night, 3 o'clock in the morning, we need somebody there that can rescue that family. In order for that to happen, we have to play a bigger role. The other thing I would like to ask on your websites, your organizations, it would be great if we can start having links so people will know well, I can go to the city of Columbia, I can go to the city of Manning the websites and find where I can click to get help for domestic violence. The main reason people don't leave with domestic violence is they don't know where they're going to go. You have to start over like I did. And that's scary. But when you have people that love you and care for you, it helps. And I was, you can block this out of your taping. <laughs> yeah, I was married to a pastor. You know, so you wouldn't expect for certain people to have to deal with certain things. But again, there's no respect of persons. There could be somebody in this room that you're sitting by now that's a victim of domestic violence. Remember, it's men, and don't forget about your teenage daughters and sons. The incident of teens being violated this way has increased. And we're teaching our sons not to hit women. We're gonna have to come up with something else because some of those men are the very men that are growing up to be abused. So let's consider that. So I don't wanna take up too much of your time. I just wanna really leave you with the thought of what can we individually do, collectively do, to help a shelter nearby and take a look at your organization's checkbook, the check register, and see what you're doing. You know, our churches take up a lot of money every Sunday. A lot of them have a benevolent offering a basket. It would be great if you can start encouraging your trustees to send some of that money to a shelter so we can help the women and the men in the middle of the night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And that was wonderful words. Um, I told you, she is a she's a wonderful, wonderful woman in kindred spirit. And last year, I've known Julia for many years, but last year when we had this luncheon was the first time that I, I found out that she was a survivor. And we talked about that. And I told her that, you know, sharing her story encourages people. Um, but specifically for you all who are advocates, it tells you that what you're doing empowers people, and I know you know it, but it can't be said enough. What you do empowers people so that the woman that you helped last week or last month may end up being the next mayor of Columbia, the next representative, the next governor, um, the next executive director of an organization. Um, they just need help and support, and you all are usually the first person that, that gives them that help and support. So. Um, thank you, Julia, and um, I appreciate you being here. Let me tell you a little bit about um, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter. Uh, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter earned her BS from Florida A&M University, and she went on to receive, excuse me, her master's from Florida State University. She then earned her LISW from South Carolina Board of Social Work Examiners. Um, she has been a teacher. Um, she's been a caseworker and she has served as the executive director of CASA Family Systems since 1985. Um, for those of you who don't know, CASA is the shelter in Orangeburg and they serve many counties and many, many women over many years. 
Um, and in addition to her passion um, for helping um, victims of domestic violence in her professional life, she every day gets up and serves this state and this nation um, in ways that we could never imagine. I mean, she is sometimes the lone reasonable voice down there fighting for what is right. Um, I remember when I was prosecuting domestic violence cases, um, you know, I'd, I'd see what they were doing. I mean, you can imagine how difficult it is to convince somebody that a person who has been convicted of harming their spouse doesn't deserve to have a gun anymore. But those are the fights that we have had and continue to have in South Carolina. And we can always count on Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter to be the voice of reason, uh, to fight for what's right, even when it's not popular. Um, and the interesting part is, you know, you'll sometimes hear people who have disagreed with her, and um, they'll, you know, you might hear people um, here and there. But one thing they can, do, uh, no matter if they agree or disagree, everybody can tell you down there. Somebody who gets respect on that floor is Gilda Cobb Hunter. And that's because they know she's going to tell it like it is, no matter who you are, what party you're in, whatever. She's going to tell it like it is, and she's going to fight for what's right. And she's going to call you out if you're not doing what's right. And so we need more inspirations like Gilda Cobb Hunter, and I just thank her for taking time out of her very busy schedule um, to be here and celebrate with us today and bring us a few words of wisdom. So without further ado, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter. Well, hey, y'all. I'm going to try to, I told this to Mika, I'm going to try to, I like having questions from people in the audience like this, so I'm going to just chat with you a little bit and then hopefully open it up for questions, if that's okay with y'all. Uh, let me first acknowledge my colleague, Mayor, Honorable, Mayor, Honorable. Um, it's good to be here, and I want to thank Councilwoman Devine for inviting me, but I really want to, and by the way, I said to Julia when Tamika said that about I have been, have been involved with CASA Family Systems for so long, Julia said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, oh, yeah, honey, I got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> I got a real job. This politics ain't, ain't what it's cut out to be. Before I get into the heart of my comments, though, I do want to reiterate two points that both these ladies have made. And I want to encourage y'all to support women who offer for public service. But I have always been very, very real. Let me add a caveat to that. I'm not just asking you to support women because of gender, just like I don't ask people to su support somebody because of race. I don't want you supporting women who are going to get in a position and just be glad to be there. Because you know what? That doesn't advance the cause. Okay? Just like supporting people of color who are just glad to be there doesn't advance the cause. So I am adding a ditto to what my two colleagues have said and saying to you, make sure that the women you support are women like these two who are going to be servant leaders, who are going to speak out when they have something to say and not just be glad to be there. Okay? So now, domestic violence. The mayor gave you all of the statistics, so I don't need to repeat those. And that's not why I'm here. I'm here first and foremost to thank y'all for what you're doing. For those of you who are advocates, and I commend uh, Councilwoman Isaac Devine for doing this recognition. I understand it's the second year. This is great, because you know what? People who do this work you are the unsung heroes. You're not the ones who are on TV being interviewed. You're not the ones who are written up in the newspaper. But don't ever be mistaken that the work you're doing, whether paid or volunteer, is not important and that you're not making a difference in the lives of the men and women who you touch. And I say men and women because, as has been pointed out, Men are victims as well. So for those of you who are volunteers who are advocates, thank you. For those of you in the room who are survivors, pat yourselves on the back. 
you are sitting here in a luncheon and celebration of advocacy and domestic violence awareness month and the fact that you're sitting here is worth celebrating because as the numbers show, we are number one in killing women in domestic violence situations. So there are a number of women who have been in these situations who don't have the luxury that you have of sitting here. So don't ever underestimate the courage you've shown. That word survivor is not used loosely. It's not used by mistake. It is an empowering word which means you are no longer a victim. There are a lot of people who believe it's just a matter of semantics you know, there are people who say, well, what's, it, what's the difference? Victim, survivor, hey, what? It makes a lot of difference. Think about it. When you think of yourself as a victim, as opposed to a survivor, there are implications that you get very well, and you don't need me to go on and on about it. But I just stopped by here today to say to you that there is something wrong in a state that has the distinction of being number one in women losing their lives. And I stopped by here to say to you, you're already in the struggle. You already got a toe in, so you got to put the other, other, other toe in. And what am I saying? You've got to break the silence. Those of you who do this work, particularly those of you who go out and do talks and stuff, you know we talk about break the silence, break the cycle, all of that. The silence I'm talking about is this issue of gun violence. We have got to step up to the plate and stop being afraid to tackle this issue. We are seeing all around us examples of what our silence is doing. People are losing their lives. Now, I serve in a body of a uh, few blocks that way, that my Lord, if you even entertain the discussion about responsible gun control registration, anything. It's like you've committed heresy or treason or some kind of terrorist. Mind you now, all these people up here who have hijacked our government, they are domestic terrorists, in my view. Pure and simple. But we don't have that kind of conversation because they are patriots. You ever notice how all these patriots never ever actually served in the military? <laughs> They're patriots on paper. So, you know, you need to consider all that. But here, here's what I want to leave you with. Nothing in life worth having comes easy. That's just the bottom line. If you want easy, this ain't the kind of work for you. You know, go sell cupcakes. And those are good cupcakes, by the way. Hey, y'all, <laughs> by the way, let's give it up for the chef and Mr. Green. Yeah. I want you to know I didn't taste the cupcakes in honor of the walking well or whatever, living well. What y'all call it? That's the let's move in honor of the first lady and all of that. I just looked at the little, um, what was those little things? You know, the little, uh, uh, was that red velvet cake cupcakes? I just looked at them and just got an extra thing of mac and cheese. <laughs> But as you can see, I've had one too many mac and cheeses in my day. But at any rate, guys, I, I really just want to say I really appreciate what y'all do. But if you don't feel particularly adventurous, courageous, or whatever, I'm a firm believer in tackling things in a small kind of way. You know, they say the best way 
to eat an elephant is what? One little bite at a time. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you that would go a long way in helping on this issue. And that's this whole notion of education and outreach. Next time you're at the beauty parlor or on the golf course or in your little quilting circle or wherever you might be, the grocery store, church, particularly if you're in church, and you're engaged in a conversation, of course, that's not when the preacher's up there talking, but as people have conversations, and whoever you're talking to, launch into this business about domestic violence and start with all of the myths and misconceptions. Well, honey, she must have did something, because I know him. He's a nice fellow. <laughs> He's a preacher. He wouldn't do that. Well, you just heard an example of why that's a lie. Oh, no, no. They are a nice family. They are from the bourgeois neighborhood. <laughs> He's a doctor, lawyer, whatever. Anytime you're engaged in conversations with people and they have clearly demonstrated that they don't know what they are talking about, you might want to consider saying in a very nice way, you might want to reconsider what you just said. Because I think there's another way to look at it. See, I'm a firm believer in using every opportunity to educate people about issues. Every moment can be a teachable, trainable moment if you take the time to do it. I'm asking each of you to consider yourselves to be teachers and to take the opportunity to educate people about this issue because, again, as has already been pointed out, you may well be in the presence of a survivor of domestic violence and don't know it. So when you're having conversations and don't know what you're talking about, you could very easily be further lowering the esteem of someone who is in that situation. So I encourage you to speak up, to speak out, and as in, in the words of Bernie Mac, I ain't scared of you. Don't be scared. <laughs> so I think I probably talked longer than 10 minutes. I've certainly talked more than I needed to. And what I'd like to do is stop at this point and see if there are any questions you all might have. Let me segue into this by saying to you, as a legislator, the last thing we need to do here in South Carolina is pass more domestic violence laws. What we need to do is enforce what's on the books. If we would just enforce the laws that are on the books, that would help a whole lot more than where we are. So, any questions? No, yes. I don't know what you're talking about. I have, uh, that is new to me. I, I didn't know that was on the books. <laughs> Well, neat, well, clearly there, that negates the point I just made because <laughs> we definitely, if that's on the books, we definitely need to t have legislation to take that off. Well, it goes back, and it's not just hitting your wife on Sundays on the state house steps. It goes back to this notion of women as property. Um, and and that, cr that permeates everything. Uh, not just domestic violence and not just the way we treat women, but, you know, there are a lot of, lot of folk who are still kind of in a plantation mentality when it comes to notions of women and our places and what we should and shouldn't do, what we should and shouldn't say. But I have to admit, I was not aware that that was a law in South Carolina. So you've, show, you've told me something I did not know. You had one, Madam Mayor. I wanted to, could you share us how you started your political career? Oh, God. Well, way back when, in Neanderthal days, um, you know, I've always.
always been, I never wanted to run for office. I've always been political, even as a kid, because I've always been curious. I've always, uh, I grew up reading a lot. You know, books will take you where money can. So I grew up reading, and I can recall in like fourth or fifth grade, you know, back then, some of y'all may, now none of y'all in here old enough to remember this, but good night, Chet, good night, David, and good night for NBC News Huntley yeah. Brinkley Report. <laughs> well, I, I would stop playing and go inside to watch Huntley Brinkley. And all of it is, y'all, I'm a firm believer in making my own decisions and hearing firsthand what's going on. I had my interest peaked in sixth grade by a social studies teacher who just made it come alive. And so I've just always been on the edges of politics. Uh, when we moved to, when I went to college, you know, the edges working, uh, doing a little grunt work in campaigns and dating myself, the first one that I can recall uh, as a freshman in college, I worked at uh, McGovern you know, took people to the polls and that kind of crap. Um, when, I mean crap in a good way. <laughs> I just thought about that. Um, went to, I really got involved politically when my husband and I moved to South Carolina. Uh, we moved here, I was bored to death uh, in Orangeburg, having moved there from Columbus, Ohio, and was just like, oh, and he got sick of me whining and having my pity party and said, why don't you do something? You know, why don't you get involved in something? And I started going to county council meetings, again, because I like firsthand, I don't have, I don't like people translating to me anything. Long story short, it didn't take me long to notice that in Orangeburg County, all of the men did everything. Uh, as far as holding the positions, and the women did all the work. And I started something called the Women of Color Political Network because I believe women ought to run for office, and I believe very clearly that there ought to be voices. I'm not one who talks women because I think that misses the boat. When you just say women, it eliminates women of color. Uh, being needed. There are African American women, there are Latino, there are Asian, Native American, all of the rainbow. And so I started saying, you know, y'all, y'all need to, y'all need to get involved. Y'all here doing all the work. These guys take the seats. They don't do anything. And I just, you know, I have affirmations. And I like sometimes to just be still. And all of this instant stuff we got now, we underestimate just quiet, where you can just be still. So I do all that stuff. You know, I'm real. I'm, I'm a flower. I'm a hippie. Proud of it. <laughs> okay. Looks like I've exhausted all the questions in the room. I've cleared the room. Um, so thank y'all so much. I appreciate it. Y'all, thanks for what you do.